good work. I want to start off by saying that I have a message this morning with your name on it. As we come today, I want you to lean forward so that you can hear what the Lord is speaking to you. It was Jesus Christ who said these words. He said, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. One of the greatest needs in the world today is truth. The absence of truth have caused people to be deceived and to be led down a path to darkness confusion, and hopelessness. All you have to do is to look and listen to the conversations around you to know how confused people are. How many of you ever thought that it would be so confusing for a person to figure out who they are? either male or female. They want to come up with a whole lot of other categories. They're confused. With that in mind, I I want to talk about proclaiming Christ to this generation. Proclaiming Christ to this generation. And proclaiming has to do with speaking. And with that said, this message is all about preachers. Now, one thing I know that church folks like to do, church folks like to talk about preachers. You have your favorite preacher. You have some preachers you like, and you have some preachers you don't like. You talk about what preachers wear. You talk about what preachers drive and where they live. You talk about preachers that have an anointing. You talk about preachers that are disappointing. And since you like to talk about preachers, I'm going to talk about them too. Will y'all help me talk about them? We know that churches have at least one preacher. Some churches have several members who testify that they have been called to preach. Some preachers are pastors. Some preachers are apostles. Others are evangelists or prophets or teachers. But there are some other preachers we hardly ever talk about that I'm going to talk about today as well. I want to talk about some preachers who misunderstand what what preaching is. I'm going to talk about preachers who don't know they're preachers. I'm going to talk about preachers who refuse to preach and have a good excuse for not doing so. But before I talk about all of these preachers, I want to look at one of the most effective preachers in Scripture. That was Paul the Apostle. Paul is sending a note to fellow believers to let them know his passion for reaching unbelievers. And I want to start in the book of Romans chapter 1 verse 13. Now, y'all are pretty quiet. If you say amen, I won't be too long. Paul is speaking in verse 13 to the church at Rome. He says, I do not want you to be unaware, brother that I plan many times to come to you 
And then he mentioned that he was kind of held up and restricted. But he says, I want to come to you in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I have had among the other Gentiles. The purpose and the plan for his coming and his preaching was so that he can have a harvest. in reaching those who are unbelievers and those who are unsaved. And whether you know it or not, this generation gives us a harvest time. If there ever was a time to gather the harvest, and if there ever was a time for a ripe harvest, it is now. I don't criticize, I used to criticize the sinners for doing what sinners do, for drugging and drinking and partying and sexually expressing themselves and all of that. I used to criticize them, but they are doing what sinners do. What I am criticizing is the saints because the saints aren't doing what the saints are supposed to do. So if the saints would do what the saints are supposed to do, we have fewer sinners doing what the sinners do. Okay. Somebody going to say amen so I can hurry up and finish. But Paul says, whatever I do when I'm preaching, I am reaching those who do not know Jesus Christ. And just like he gathered a harvest among the Gentiles, he says, I'm coming among the Jews and I want to gather a harvest among you as well. Paul was a preacher. Now let me take some time now to talk about preachers and preaching. First, let me tell you what preaching is not. Preaching is not hooping. Preaching is not yelling and screaming at the audience and telling everybody to touch their neighbor and tell them something that don't make sense. That's not preaching. Come on, tell, touch your neighbor, tell them you're going to get yours tonight. What does that mean? Come on, touch your neighbor, tell them your harvest is on the way. Well, when is it coming? Come on, somebody touch your neighbor and give them a high five and tell them, I'm in the best place I've ever been. All that kind of stuff. That's not preaching. Come on, touch your neighbor. Tell them you're going to take back what the devil done stole. People have been saying that, but every time I see them, it looks like the devil still have their stuff. So we got all these cliches and sayings that we put out to members in the church, but when push comes to shove, nothing has changed. How many times somebody has said, well, this year is your year for God's favor and blessings to be poured out in your life and the next year come and you're still in the same place. I don't want to hear much more of that. That's not preaching. Preaching is not getting to the point in a sermon where the organist and the musicians chime in to back you up. That's not preaching. Preaching is not repeating slogans and Bible verses and cute sayings in a rhythm until the audience stand up and talk back to you. Come on, somebody talk back to me. That's not preaching. That is a style of delivery, but it's not preaching. It's not working and and sweating with a terry cloth towel until you can get somebody to start shouting and you drop the mic. That's entertainment. That is not preaching. And if there's something we don't need more of today is entertainment without power. 
But we've been preaching in the church for a generation and the church hasn't moved forward at all to accomplish the things that God wants us to accomplish. And we end up with people coming to be entertained. And if you just watch like I do, sometimes they sit there and they're just uh, just uh, uh, floating around or not paying close attention until they get to the part where the hooping starts. And then they say, yeah, now I'm stand up. I want to hear Yeah, talk to me. Do you think the Apostle Paul, who was one of the most effective soul winners in history, stood up and said to the, t- told the folks to touch your neighbor and tell them that your help is on the way? Tonight is your night? No. Here's what he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. He said, when I preach, I preach in the power of the Holy Ghost that will change people's lives. When they get through here, but I didn't talk them into it. See, if somebody can talk you and persuade you to get saved, somebody else will persuade you to not be saved. But when the power of God comes in and touches your heart and changes your life, you can say, I am a new creation in Christ. Because if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. You don't have to try to follow them up and chase them down to make them come to church when they really have the power of God that energizes their life. You don't have to do a follow-up on them. They'll be running to church, running to hear the word of God, anxious to hear the word of God. That's when the power of the Holy Ghost comes in their lives and changes us. And that's what is needed. We have no more time left on the hourglass to play church. Time is too critical. Too many people are dying without Christ. And the church is looking for another entertainment feature. So I talked about what preaching is not. Let me talk about what preaching is. Biblical preaching is Defined simply as proclaiming. To proclaim, to publish, to announce, to be a herald, to declare, to show, to bring forth. And biblically the word preach is akin to the word evangelizo that we translate evangelize. It's almost always used with reference to the gospel to bring or declare the good news of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. To preach means to declare the good news of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. You can do that in a soft, calm voice. The preacher is a messenger. A public cry or sent by God. And so in our text in the book of Romans chapter 1, Paul said this in verse 14, I am obligated both to the Greeks and the non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you at Rome. He says, I'm eager to preach to you. I'm obligated. So you have to be obligated in order to be an effective preacher. I want to share the news. I want to share the news. I want to share the news. Now, if I was preaching, I would say, touch your neighbor and say, I want to share the news. Now, I'm going you do that. <laughs> but I want you to say to yourself, if you really mean it, say, I want to share the news. You must be committed and have a passion to reach people for the kingdom of God. Do you even think about it? Do you even have a passion? Do you really want to? 
Paul says, I was obligated to the wise, the foolish, the Greeks, non-Greeks, the people you like and the people you don't like, the people that's like you and the people that's not like you. Are you willing to reach them for the cause of Christ? Then he says he's eager then to preach them. So he was obligated and he was eager. So what about you? How many of you feel obligated and how many of you really feel eager to share your testimony? Then Paul then makes a statement of his personal passion and his commitment. And he makes this statement about boldly proclaiming Christ. He said this, and you've heard this before. In verse 16, he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. That's Paul now. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. He could not, and he did not speak for anybody else. He said, I'm talking about me. I don't know about you. I don't know whether you're ashamed. I don't know whether you're obligated. I don't know whether you're eager. But me, I am not ashamed. And before I leave here today, I want, to, I want some people to declare that I am not ashamed. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. He had a testimony. That's why he says, I'm not ashamed. So why is Paul not ashamed? Paul says, I'm not ashamed because I was on a road to Damascus to persecute some Christians. And I had an experience that changed my life. I was on my horse and a bright light from heaven shine and knocked me off of my horse and sent me to the ground. And I knew that somebody more powerful than me out of divine force was reckoning with me. And I said, Lord, what is, what's going on? He said, who are you? He says, I'm the Lord and I got a mission for you, Paul. Paul says, I ain't ashamed to tell that because it changed my life. Paul says, I'm not ashamed because I, I had a miracle of deliverance when I was in the jail cell with Silas and we were in the bottom of the jail and it was dark and it was damp and we were chained to the wall. But at midnight, angels came and shook that jail cell and set me free. I ain't ashamed to tell nobody what God has done for me. That's what Paul says. I ain't ashamed of that. He says, I'm not ashamed of telling how God rescued me when I was stoned. For preaching and they thought they killed me but he, he rescued me and, and restored my body the next thing you know I was preaching again I ain't ashamed he says I've been through shipwrecks and famines and prisons if anybody could say he's done so much for me I cannot tell it all it was Paul The main reason Paul is not ashamed of the gospel, he said, because it has the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. He says, I know what the gospel can do because he did it for me. He said, if he can save me, he can save anybody. If he can change my life, he can change anybody's life. And I'm not ashamed to tell people what God has done for me. He says he's not ashamed because he wants to see people come to Christ. Now, here's the question. What about you? What about you? Many times we are right in the middle of our current situation and crisis that we have forgotten where God has brought us from. We've forgotten what we were like before we came to Christ. We forgot what our life was like, how burdened we were, how thrown off we were, how deep in sin we were. Some of us was an addicted to alcohol and drugs. Some of us had an immoral lifestyle we couldn't get out of. Some of us was in dark days, but Jesus Christ came in. He saved you. He picked you up and turned you around. Have you forgotten that? Are you ashamed of what he did for you? Are you willing to share that with somebody? 
Well, if you are saved, so here's the question. How many of you are saved? If you are saved, you are called by Christ and you are called to preach. The Lord has saved you and delivered you from sin. You ought to tell somebody. Has the Lord ever healed you when you were sick? You ought to preach that to somebody. Has the Lord provided for you? Oh, you're the one that say he can make a way out of no way. Well, you ought to tell somebody that don't know that he's a way maker. Has he been a doctor in a sick room? You ought to tell somebody that don't know he's a doctor in a sick room that he's a doctor in a sick room. Well, you could say he's a lawyer in the courtroom. He gives you spiritual wisdom on how to deal with your situation. Well, you need to tell somebody. Uh, you, you may not know this, honey, but God is able to change your life. You are the preacher I've been talking about all the time who don't know you're a preacher. You are the preacher that says, I don't want to preach. And I got all kind of excuses. I can tell you why I'm not doing it. You are the preacher that need to proclaim the word of God to those who don't know him. Has he protected your family? Now you can sing about it all you want to while you're in church, but we don't need to hear your testimony in here. We don't need to hear your testimony. Somebody who don't know need to find that God is real because you have shared with them. You are the preacher who misunderstand what preaching is. You think it's somebody who's going to stand behind a pulpit. No, it's you. The preacher, you are the preacher who do not know that you're a preacher. You are the preacher who do not preach. We've been taught that the preacher is the pastor, the evangelist, the apostle, the prophet. Here's what Jesus told his disciples in the book of Acts chapter 1 and 8. Go to Jerusalem and stay there. Until you receive power from on high and you will be my witnesses, my preachers. Everywhere you go, 120 people were in that room, in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. And the Bible says all of them, somebody say all of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Ghost. And Jesus wanted all of them to preach. He wanted all of them to reach. He wanted all of them to be his witnesses. So everybody he saves, he saved to be the preacher. Uh, are these people over here getting it? These people over here say, you're talking about me? Yes, I'm talking about you. You have been saved to be the preacher. Now, that don't mean you got to go get a collar and a Cadillac. That means that you need to just share your faith with somebody and tell them about Jesus Christ. See, the early church would have never grown to the point that it grew if Peter did all the preaching. The reason the church is not growing today is the pastor is doing all the preaching. The preachers in the seat are just listening, saying amen, and going home, and then coming back waiting for the next praise break. That's not how he designed this. It was about five or six weeks ago, you all remember when that little storm came through and knocked out all the windows downtown? Yes. It was that same weekend we had, in the other chapel building, we had four funeral services on that weekend because the funeral home's power was out and they said, can we have these services? And I was there on a Friday, it was one Friday morning, Friday evening, Saturday morning, and Saturday evening. One of the people funeralized was a lovely young lady. She was single, 26 years old, college graduate, had a job, no children. 
unmarried. She hung herself. Another one was a young man. He had a doctorate degree in petrochemical, worked at a major company, had all kinds of awards, two pages worth of accolades about his awards and innovations and how he's introduced new things to the company. He was married, eight-year-old child, twins that were five months old. He hung himself. And I'm thinking, what, what are they dealing with? They have no hope. They can't see their way forward. There's somebody sitting next to you on your job or sitting next to you uh, on, a, on the bus or on the airplane or wherever you are. They're helpless. They're hopeless. They're going through things and they don't know a way. And here we are. We got the light. We have the gospel with power. And here we are. Jesus said, take the cover off the light, please. Somebody needs that joy. Somebody needs that hope. You have it. You have an assignment. This generation needs it. It's a generation of people that didn't go to Sunday school with their grandma and their, and their papa and their mama and them. They haven't heard about the delivering power of God, the love and the grace and the forgiveness. They don't know nothing about that. You may think they know, but they don't know. They've heard too much stuff online and in social media about who they ought to be and what they ought to do. And they're disappointed that they can't keep up with the folks on social media who are lying to them. Be like me. Do like me. They don't know they're lying about what they got. So where are you? We need every believer to boldly proclaim Christ to this generation. Every believer. Every person who say they're saved. Every one of you. Listen, our salvation is not for us just to come to God every week and cry out to him about him meeting our needs. What did that last song say? Will you say yes to what God wants you to do in your life? God meets your need. God blesses you. But he's looking for somebody who's a laborer. He said uh, the harvest is ripe and the laborers are few because the preachers are sitting in the seat and they won't move. The gospel still have the power to save the lost. Still have the power to set the captives free. Still have the power to loose those who are bound. The gospel still has the power. We just need somebody to begin to proclaim it. Your witness is still needed. Your preaching is still needed. Not your hooping, not your hollering, but your testimony. Are you ashamed of what God has done for you? Are you ashamed that he saved you? He healed you? How he provided for you? How he set you free? Listen, why should the saints be the only one ashamed to talk? People are talking crazy all over the place. They're talking crazy. They'll come up to you. They don't even know you. They'll just start talking crazy to you. Well, you still talk, start talking crazy to them about the Lord. Say, honey, let me just share something with you, what God has done for me. Romans 10 says this, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. What is, how many of them? Everybody who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. God says, the power says, uh, Paul says the, 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 the gospel has the power in it. Not you, but the gospel has the power in it. And then he asked this question, how then can they call on the one if they've not believed in? How can these people call on the Lord they haven't believed in? Him? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? They ain't heard about it. 
What does he mean? Do they know uh, something? Have they heard about Jesus? Yes, I heard about Jesus. But I haven't heard about anybody who said that that's working for them. I haven't heard from anybody that said Jesus came into their life and changed them. I haven't heard anybody say that Jesus healed them. I haven't heard anybody say Jesus is the, is the King of kings and the Lord of lords in their own life. I haven't heard from anybody that can authenticate who Jesus is. I heard about him, but I ain't heard nobody say they know him. See, you expect me to do what I'm doing today. Oh, that's the preacher. He's supposed to do that. Well, do what you're supposed to do. He says, and how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without somebody that's sitting in the seats in the church preaching to them? Someone. He didn't say the preacher. He didn't say the pastor. He didn't say the prophet, apostle, evangelist. Someone, how can they hear without somebody they know? Somebody they work with. Somebody that they lives in their neighborhood. Somebody went to school with them. Somebody in their family. Speaking to them. Preaching to them. Not hollering at them. Not condemning them but just tell them what God has done for you. That's all he's asking you to do. Tell them what God has done for you. Let me just tell you, I was messed up, but God really came in my life. I was confused. I was bitter. I was depressed. And I don't know what's going on with you, but I just want to let you know that God did it for me. And if you would trust him, he would do it for you. That's the simple gospel. It's the good news. You got some good news? You are the someone who has been called to preach. I said I had a message with your name on it. Well, you are the preacher. You are ordained to preach because I'm ordaining you today. You are licensed to preach because I am giving you a license today. And this is what I want to do. Our theme for the whole year is let's go and let's grow. And it's very challenging to get the people of God to become interested in doing the things that God wants done. Here's what I found out. If I'm taking care of God's business, God will take care of my business. If you're out there reaching people for Christ and you get sick, God says, I can't have them sick. They're working too hard. Let me send some healing over there. You have financial problems, God said, I need to pour a blessing on them because they're working too hard for me, for me, for them to have to struggle with their finances. If you're taking care of God, that's why Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. And Paul says, and my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. God have everything you need and he will supply all of your need while you are taking care of kingdom business. So I'm going to challenge you today. and we want to, I'm going to challenge you. I want you to listen to me closely. I'm going to ask you to do three things for those who will. There are still going to be preachers who will not preach. But there are going to be some of you preachers who will take this message and allow God to use your life. There are three things. Number one, I'm looking for those who will say, I am not ashamed of the gospel. That's number one. That's you. Just mark that by you. Number two, I'm looking for those who will say, I will allow God to use my voice and my story to reach others. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Secondly, I will allow God to use my voice and my story to reach others. And thirdly, I will be active. I will pray and I will ask God to lead me, and then I'm just going to take a step of faith 
and begin to share my story with people that God brings in my pathway. For those of you who would say, that's me, I would do those three things, I'm going to pray a prayer of release over you today and ask God. You know, Jesus, I'm not Jesus and I'm not God. I don't have the power, but I have the words of God. Jesus spoke to his disciples, says, I'm sending you out, and I'm sending you out with power. And I'm going to pray over you, and I'm going to anoint you with the prayer, and anoint you, and I ordain you, and I'm going to license you to go. So those who would say, number one, pastor, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Number two, I will allow the God to use, God to use my story and my voice to reach others. And number three, I will commit to be active. And speaking to those who God brings to me. Would you, those of you who declare that, I want you to come forward. I'm going to pray for you. Don't take long. Let's move quickly. Those who will declare that, I want you to come. It is time for us to make a difference. Look at all these preachers that are coming forward. Listen, you don't have to be perfect to be a preacher. You just got a story. You say, Lord, I have this story. Listen, even your failures, even your pain, even the things that you're going through at any time. That, see, the enemy wants to th- want you to think that God don't want to use you. That's the biggest lie that he's put on the, on the church. God don't want to use you. Look at the stuff you got to going through. You just say, hey, listen, you don't know what people are going through. Go- we look at the outward appearance. God look at the heart. There are people that are sitting next to you are crashing and burning. And they're smiling because they don't want you to know. But God knows. Wherever you are, God put you there for a divine purpose, to be that light, to be that voice, to be that preacher, to be that minister, just to share. You ain't got to tell them nothing else. You, you dust off your testimony. Go home and begin to write down all the things you think that God has done for you. Put it on a list and say, yeah, I, I, I remember that. That was 15 years ago. That was year before last. That was, oh, I remember I remember that accident I had that I could have been killed, but God spared my life. I remember when he opened the door for me to get a job. I remember all the things that you remember. Jesus, I'll never forget what you've done for me. I'm not going to forget it, so I'm going to tell somebody. I'm going to keep it alive. Tell them just like it happened yesterday. Let me just tell you what happened to me. You have to tell me it was 20 years ago. Whether it was or not, it's still good. Hallelujah. Every once in a while, I have a flashback. Lord, thank you. Before I was even saved, you were taking care of me. Hallelujah. I remember I could have ran off the road when I was driving and it wasn't in my right mind. I could have ran off the road. You protected me. I was I was a fool. And you protected me. I should have been dead and gone. But you've done great things for me. That's the kind of God we serve. (laughs) Father, I thank you, mighty God, for this day. You have called us for such a time as this. In this dark hour, we are the light. We have the power of the gospel on the inside of us. And you're just looking for us to share right now. Father, I begin to anoint these people with the power of the Holy Ghost to speak your word with boldness right now. With not with persuasive word, but with power of the Holy Spirit that's on the inside. They are not ashamed. Come on, say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Father, we thank you. You've heard this declaration. They say, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Let the gospel begin to flow out of them. I ordain them right now to speak your word with boldness right now, God. Everyone, we come against every spirit of fear and intimidation right now, God. Their story is their story and nobody can... Uh, can can say that it's not valid. Nobody can argue with their story right now. Use their story right now to change lives, to bring people into the kingdom, to deliver and to save and to heal. Right now, in the name of Jesus, I give them the license of the kingdom of God to go forth as an ambassador for you and your kingdom right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, mighty God, for all of these preachers who are proclaiming the good news to this lost generation. 
We thank you for it now. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Come on, give the Lord a praise. Glory to God. Thank you, mighty God. Hallelujah. Now you can look at the person right on your right and your left and say, God bless you, preacher. Come on, just talk. <laughs> God bless you, preacher. Come on, God bless you, preacher. Yeah, look at all these preachers in here. Glory to God. <laughs> Hallelujah. You may be seated. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord God. Listen, I'm expecting some testimonies from those of you who says I'm not ashamed. I am not ashamed. Listen, what would it be like if every person that have come up here today would share their testimony with one or two people this week? God's going to use that. If everyone would just say, hey, let me just tell you some things that happened in my life. The Holy Spirit will nudge you and open the door if you have a desire to do so. He will open the door for you to share. And all you have to do is say, hey, let me tell you a couple things that happened. Let me, let me tell you a little bit of my story. You know, I was, I was going through some tremendous challenges, and most of us have had tremendous challenges. You know, and I didn't, didn't have a good feeling for the way my life was going to go, and I gave my life to Jesus Christ, and he really changed my life. I don't know what you're going through, but Jesus Christ can change your life. You don't know him. Right? That's as simple as that. You don't have to... Uh, you don't have to know every scripture in the Bible to, t to tell your story. Somebody need to hear your story. When we had our men uh, event a few months, uh, a few weeks ago, I had the representative from, he was a funeral director, and he said, we've had more young people dying this year. He said, I've had 18 burials of uh, young people uh, under 21 years old. Suicides, drug overdose, careless lifestyle, stealing cars and wrecking them. This generation is, is, needs our help. They need, the, they need the delivering power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we have it. Amen. If you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, he's the one that changed my life, and he will change your life. I don't know where you are. You may be listening online, or you may be in the service and say, Pastor, I'm not sure where I stand with Jesus Christ today. But there's going to be a time where we're going to have to stand before Christ as our judge, and he's going to judge us whether we accepted him or didn't accept him. If you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, all he asks is that you will come to him in earnest and say, I need you, Lord, in my life. We can say that just because somebody has put the opportunity there, or we can say that because we are sincere in our heart. And he knows when we are sincere. We're not just trying to count a number and say, how many people will say you, you, know, you are saved? No, we want you to have a genuine life-changing experience with the Lord Jesus Christ that will only occur when you are serious and say, Lord, I am ready to stop trying to be the one who runs my own life and I want you to take control of my life. Be my Lord and my Savior. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, I'm ready to make that commitment, I want you to stand on your feet right now. I want you to stand on your feet. says, I want to make that commitment. I'm not sure where I stand with Christ today, but I want to do that. And if you're online, you can make that commitment and let us know. We want to be sure that there's every opportunity for those who want to know Christ to come to know him. And for those of you who come forward today, don't just leave here today and say, well, that was a good message. You go home and you begin to actively write down your uh, things that God has done for you and start asking the Lord, say, Lord, help me to be able to share the good news with those who you want me to share it with. And he will prompt you by his spirit. He'll put people in your way. And then all he wants you to do is share. And when he does that, that's the person he's trying to reach. Amen.